Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Heyman. Uh, I'm happy to be back to talk about the cell danger response and the role of the mitochondria and their reaction to uh, cellular threats. So this is a really important topic and one that I think is uh, emerging in the literature. Uh, I, I follow quite closely my colleague and uh, friend, Dr. Bob Navio out of UC uh, San Diego. He really has done some incredible work in his metabolomics uh, mitochondrial research lab, looking at the ways in which uh, mitochondria react to uh, their local environment. And what he's uncovered, I think, is really extraordinary. This, this notion that the mitochondria have this life of their own and not just a sensory system to the interior and exterior of the cell, uh, but the way in which they control reactions of the cell uh, to a variety of threats. And this insight, uh, I think, really begins to pull together uh, the, the, the notion of cell energetics as well as uh, cell defense mechanisms and how uh, cells sort of consume substrates and uh, create preferred reactions down uh, critical uh, uh, self-protective pathways. It really is an incredible uh, amount of work that he's done and I think dovetails very well with uh, my research group's genomics re uh, research uh, in the mitochondrial orchestration to a certain subtype of, of threats. And we're sort of a piece of the pie, uh, but I think he's had this sort of larger framework uh, that really is insightful uh, and, and demonstrates how the mitochondria go through various, uh, various phases of reaction to um, uh, to orchestrate these uh, series of relatively predictable predictable events. So I'll briefly review mitochondrial anatomy and discuss this emerging model of uh, mitochondrial metabolism. And uh, in the future, at one of my other talks, uh, I'll also go into detail and review uh, the transcriptomics of uh, mitochondrial DNA and uh, the chronic inflammatory response. I'll describe it in this talk to some to some extent and set the stage for uh, a much deeper dive into our work um, with some subsequent lectures. So if you all recall, when we go way back to our early education um, as healthcare providers in molecular biology, uh, we probably remember something about the mitochondria as being um, important to the cell uh, because of its ability to produce energy. And, you know, if you remember, we used to call it the power pack of the cell uh, because in particular, it produces that really important substrate, ATP, adenine triphosphate. Uh, so the mitochondria are one, uh, a half to one millimeter in diameter and up to seven millimeters uh, long. They're located in all cells except just a few. Uh, the skeletal muscle, brain, and kidney will have uh, actually a large number of mitochondria. And um, the mitochondria has its own uh, genome and DNA, which is it, it really important to uh, appreciate. It turns out that, you know, through inherited lineage, um, you know, the mitochondria has uh, enjoyed the benefit of, uh, um, you know, countless generations of refinement of the DNA material. Uh, but interestingly, only 37 genes uh, still exist in the mitochondrial genome itself, and the rest of mito um, have migrated to the, to the nucleus. Um, they're also capable of self-dividing when needed, so they change their uh, physical shape uh, in addition to uh, their numbers, and they're responsible for the fuel for all other cells and organs and, and tissues throughout the body. And they have uh, two important membranes uh, quite different from each other, each composed though of a phospholipid bilayer. I will get back to this uh, with respect to, I think it's clinical importance. And they're distinct in terms of their chemical composition, which to some degree determines their, uh, their biological activity. We have the outer membrane, the intermembrane space, the inner membrane, and then the uh, matrix itself, uh, which of course includes the mitochondrial 
uh, DNA, and that's where ATP is, is produced. So the main functions of the mitochondria are to synthesize ATP. We call this oxidative phosphorylation. It means that we're burning energy in the presence of oxygen. And this is not the only pathway by which mitochondria can produce energy, uh, but it's the preferred one because it's the way in which we produce the most energy. It turns out, though, that even if this feels familiar to you as sort of the byline of what mitochondria do, uh, if we look at sort of their, uh, you know, a broader set of capacities and activities, it's really extraordinary what they control. So they're involved in calcium homeostasis in the cell. They promote cell growth and uh, signal transmission. They're responsible for apoptosis, uh, not just in the case of trauma, but just program cell death in general. They generate oxidative radicals during energy formation. So think about that for a second. It means that the mitochondria n don't just orchestrate energy production. They also orchestrate the cell's ability to react to a threat. In addition to that, they support nerve conduction by helping neurotransmitter release. Now, you might recall that as we go back to this notion of well, how does the mitochondria produce energy? There are several steps, and it starts with the uh, citric acid cycle and the breakdown of pyruvate uh, from glucose, and then it's beta oxidized as the spiral turns, and we have ATP that are produced. And the ATP then are donated to different uh, cells. Uh, to produce energy. And this is sort of where we thought most of the activity lay when it came to the mitochondria, which was the citric acid cycle or what we call the Krebs cycle. This should all sound relatively familiar to you. And then in addition to that, we have the electron transport chain. And there are five complexes that donate hydrogen molecules into the intermembrane space. And this continues to help facilitate energy production. This is where uh, we get into uh, therapeutic agents like coenzyme Q10 and carnitine, which acts as a shuttle, and ribose, which is the backbone for ADP and ATP. Uh, so all designed to sort of facilitate this idea of uh, uh, energy production vis-a-vis -vis ATP and, and hydrogen pumps. With that being said, the mitochondria have additional functions, and this includes signaling through mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. So, in fact, and interestingly, and this is part of the world of Dr. Navio, and I would listen closely to this, is that when the cell is threatened and it starts to produce ATP, ADP, reactive oxygen species, these are meant to be cell signaling molecules, that there's a bloom of these that are created in immediate response to a threat, and it lets other cells know that this particular cell is under duress. So in addition to that, as I mentioned, apoptosis, heme synthesis, steroid synthesis, hormonal signaling, you might say, I didn't realize that the mitochondria do so many different things. Well, it turns out it doesn't. It makes sense because you think about this orchestration issue of the mitochondria sensing danger, well, then it starts to organize that response. But if that response is impaired to one degree or another, then uh, we can see these downstream pathways all the way through the organ and system level become affected and even impaired. So, quote, um, whether they appreciate mitochondrial disorders or not, practice, practicing clinicians see patients with mitochondrial impairment virtually every day in their clinical practices. And of course, these clinical disorders have been associated with a variety of illness states. And just about everything that we see in clinical practice leads back to one degree or another to the mitochondria. Say, well, how is that possible? How is that that, you know, I learned the mitochondria are really all about producing energy and ATP. Okay, fine, I get that. But how is it that they interface with a variety of these different disease states too?
and enter the work of Dr. Navio. The first piece of that equation that he identified was this notion that when a cell is threatened, there's a very subtle depolarization in the outer cell membrane. And when that electron depolarization occurs, the first organelle to sense that in the interior of the cell is the mitochondria. And right away, almost immediately, the mitochondria changes its behavior. And one of the first things that it does is that it begins to produce a variety of compounds that either help with internal regulation of the mitochondria or begin to signal local cells that this cell is sensing a threat. One of the first things it does is create a bloom of ATP. And that acts as a local signaling compound to tell other cells, hey, something is going on with me. In addition to that, we see acetate formation, production of inflammatory fatty acids, and alterations of phospholipids. So the composition of fatty acids start to change into that pro-inflammatory state, and the composition of the phospholipids change. You might say, well, why would the cell start producing abnormal phospholipids, ceramides, and trans fats, and odd saturated fats, and now all of a sudden the cell membrane is becoming impregnated with these phospholipid compounds that aren't very facilitative for normal cell function. Well, it turns out that what the cell is trying to do is wall itself off. And it's literally erecting a barrier around itself by altering the structure of these important compounds. And this changes the uh, membranous structures inside cells too. And I said, well, why does it do that? Well, it's doing that, we believe, not so much to keep invaders out per se, but the theory right now is that the cell does this because it's trying to uh, prevent any internal vaders that have made it inside the cell from egress, from leaving the cell, from replicating and infecting other cells. So it's meant to defend against any sort of intracellular threat, that the cell is trying to turn itself into its own island. In addition to that, we see um, uh, the actual shape and size of mitochondria change. So we go from fission diffusion, we can see this almost immediately, that the uh, mitochondria phenotypically begin to alter how they look. Remember, I mentioned this in the first lecture with another cell, just the member is called the macrophage, and it goes from a M1 to an M2 phenotypic state, where M1 is a pro-inflammatory state and M2 is an anti-inflammatory cleanup crew type state. Well, mitochondria do the same thing. And in addition to that, then we also see the mitochondria begin to change its capacity for, re, uh, for production of pumping out reactive oxygen species and aldehydes and polyamines. Uh, and in addition to that, it's producing hydrogen peroxide and inflammatory cytokines. You say, wait a minute, the mitochondria do all of this? Say, yeah, it does all of this. It's switching from energy mode to battle mode. The mitochondria, now we're going into all hands on deck. And if there's a cellular threat because of that very subtle electron depolarization, guess what? The mitochondria organize all of these reactions. And make no mistake, and this is an important corollary, this isn't just metabolomics and being able to measure small molecules which brilliantly Dr. Navio did, but there are genes associated with each of these compounds tied to the mitochondria. And say, oh my gosh, it's not just genes and their ability to sort of support the Krebs cycle and molecular metabolism and the production of ATP. No, there are genes associated with all of these compounds tied to the mitochondria, they're mitochondrial genes. And then ultimately then, because the mitochondria are signaling other cells, and this other cells go into battle mode, now we begin to orchestrate a more whole body level 
uh, sickness behavior, that the that there are whole systems that are influenced by this process. And you say, oh my gosh, I never really thought of this, but it makes total sense that, of course, if a cell needs to quickly switch from burning energy to producing defense compounds, well, what would be the ideal uh, organelle to do that? It'd be the mitochondria. And sure enough, it does. Now, overlaid on top of that, is this broader notion that the mitochondria go through phases of reaction. And these phases of reaction is the, uh, the predictable progression of how the mitochondria orchestrate a reaction to a threat and attempts to deal with that threat and then eventually head back into healing and repair so the uh, first phase of that reaction the cell danger response number one the early activity is look at this here's our friend the innate immune system that yes within the cell danger response in the uh, first phase we see a switch from burning oxygen and instead promoting glycolysis and producing inflammatory compounds. So we're turning on the innate immune system and an inflammatory reaction. But because of this, we can see excess metabolic damage, uh, alterations of apoptosis, ephrocytosis, necrocytosis, necrocytosis, and phagocytosis. Now, in an orderly reaction, it, this the the mitochondria should say okay we've shifted how we burn energy we're going into a sickness state we're now producing inflammatory compounds but do we want to stay stuck there no we don't want to stay stuck there as a reaction to these um uh, uh cellular threats we want to progress and we want to progress to the cdr2 which is called proliferative physiology. And this is designed for biomass replacement and to begin to augment uh, regenerative capacity. So now the cell is preferentially burning glucose with pyruvate disposition, even less oxygen consumption. And now we're in aerobic glycolysis. And for those of you who are sort of students of medical history, you might remember a guy named Otto Warburg. And Warburg talked about this in the 1940s and 50s. He identified aerobic glycolysis as an alternate version of energy production, often tied to, for example, insulin resistance and diabetes, that it's a low energy state that allows the body, though, to produce uh, the basic building box, uh, blocks of compounds. And so this is where granulomas and gliosis can form as well as fibrosis and scarring because of mechanical strain, we call in the fibroblast. Um, and in addition to that, we can also see some excess uh, DNA damage and alteration of, of senescence. So this is, we're entering proliferative physiology, proliferative physiology as the cells beginning to organize itself for regrowth. So then as it moves through that phase, we're now in CDR3, when cell proliferation and migration have stopped, and recently mitotic cells can begin to differentiate and take on organ-specific functions. So now we're in differentiation and development. We're beginning to get in what's called an autonomous oxidative phosphorylation, which isn't quite as efficient as aerobic, um, I'm sorry, oxidative phosphorylation proper, but we're getting there. Now, this is where we see if there are issues beginning to develop, autoimmune conditions, psychiatric disorders, cancers, that CDR3 promotes the development, but in an abnormal fashion of either mistakes in the immune system or poor repair. And then finally, as the cell goes through it properly, a repair process. We're now back in normal activity at the top. So CDR1, innate immune response to all sorts of threats. Our group does biotoxins, meaning organisms. 
Now the mitochondria shift into CDR2, proliferative physiology, hypometabolism, risk for diabetes, risk for heart disease, risk for neurodegenerative disorders. But at the same time, uh, the cell is beginning to prepare for uh, you know, rebuilding and growth. So proliferation. And then finally, CDR3, where we get differentiation and development, uh, but at the risk of autoimmune conditions, pain, neurologic and psychiatric symptoms, uh, and cancers. And then finally, as it moves through that, normally we get back to uh, a, a regular state of health. Brilliant in terms of its organizational structure and maps completely to you know the work that our group did as well. And so this notion that um, the mitochondria have this orchestrating function uh, was an incredible insight. And he only got there because of the wonderful small molecule research, we call that metabolomics, that could see all these changes that were occurring, occurring in a predictable fashion as the mitochondria are trying to adjust to and move through you know, different phases of, of reaction to a cellular threat. Now, on another level, and I want you to stare at this a little bit because this is going to, I think, blow your mind of the um, functional medicine devotees. So, you know, I've always felt like functional medicine on the one hand, in its spirit, said, okay, the body is a system of systems. And there are these organized responses, compensatory reactions, uh, changes in small molecules that must mean something. And we can see alterations in nutrients and amino acids and fatty acids and neurotransmitters and on and on and on. And we said, oh, my gosh, this is beginning to make sense that if we can measure the uh, small molecule patterns that relate to the machinery of the body, maybe we can kind of break through the disease model and look at the function of how our bodies are orchestrated. Now look at this and you say, hmm, wait a minute, this is a talk on mitochondria. And you say, Dr. Heyman, what does all this mean? And I say, well, these are all of the pathways that mitochondria support and are part of that mitochondrial orchestration, that the mitochondria has influence over all of these activities. And you say, oh my gosh, I never realized that the mitochondria control everything from oxygen consumption, ATP generation, glutathione, as well as even affecting the vitamin D receptor as it relates to, is it going to change down the pathway of inflammation autoimmunity or up into autophagy and uh, anti-inflammatory function? Well, and Dr. Dr. Heyman, I, I've been very focused on, on methylation and MTHFR gene. Well, did you know that the process of methylation is deeply influenced by the mitochondria, including demethylation. And you go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. What about neurotransmitter function? Yes. What about NF-kappa beta and histamine? Well, you know, I've caught onto this notion of mast cell activation. It must be those mast cells that are overproducing histamine. Eh, wrong answer. It's the mitochondria, and I'll show you data on that. And don't forget, there are genes associated with all of these activities that are mitochondrial genes. The urea cycle, cytochromes, and here we go, our friends, the phospholipids. So when things are healthy, they go up. We have membrane fluidity and normal composition, but when the cell's reacting, now we have increased saturation because the mitochondria changed the composition of the phospholipids. And here we go. We have decreased fluidity, decreased pathogen egress, ingress, and decreased cell-to-cell -cell communication. The cell walls itself off as it goes from uh, an energy plant into a battleship. And that's what I want you to keep in your head. The mitochondria orchestrate this transition from an energy plant to a battleship. And that's why you get all of these downstream changes that you've been measuring. All, you, all the functional medicine lovers out there who love measuring 
you know, nutrients and amino acids and fatty acids and phospholipids and neurotransmitters and the methylation cycle. And guess what? Guess what you're measuring? You're measuring the end result of likely a person who's sick, number one, and therefore the mitochondria has orchestrated these changes. And it doesn't stop there. Look at this. The tryptophan metabolism, as well as orchestration of lysine, calcium homeostasis, cholesterol synthesis, as well as NAD, which of course is brain food, uh, the arachidonic acid cascade, the uh, sphingocytes, which are sphingomyelins and ceramides, part of the phospholipids, and then even the body's ability to detoxify. Look at this. We get heavy metal sequestration as a result. Why? Because the body's becoming more acidic in its response. The cells are walling themselves off. They're not getting rid of junk. They're holding on to stuff. And then look at this final one. There are even changes in the microbiome. We can see gluten sensitivity absolutely as part of that CDR1, CDR2. No doubt. Dysbiosis? Oh, yeah. Alternating constipation, diarrhea? Almost every biotoxin patient has that. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Think about this for a second. The mitochondria, the organelle that senses a threat, and it says, okay, I'm going to orchestrate a variety of responses to protect the life of the cell and neighboring cells. And that isn't just one thing. It's many, 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 many reactions simultaneously. And I'm going to alter a variety of these compounds at the benefit of the host, but also the detriment. Because energy levels are changing. We go into that pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative state. And the cell is doing everything it can to deal with this. But think about what this means. Think about what this means. So if we've been stuck in the model of just measuring those end products, nutrients, fatty acids, all sorts of biochemicals, methylation pathways, the body's ability to detoxify, what do you think you're going to find in a stressed patient? You're going to find all sorts of abnormalities. Now, if I take those abnormalities and I put them into a clinical model and I ask the question, Dr. Heyman, because I'm finding there's an inflammatory process going on and nutrient deficiencies and hormonal imbalances and abnormal fatty acids and lipids and, you know, the, the patient is holding on to uh, toxic compounds and they're having a hard time detoxifying and their methylation cycle isn't working very well. What if I treat those? What if I treat the leaves on the tree? Will that sort of give us the reverse signal back down to the mitochondria? So the mitochondria start shifting efficiently through those sections of the cell danger response. Will that facilitate a progression back to that healthy state of affairs? Because this is what we do every day in our practices, right? We we find nutrient deficiencies and inflammatory processes and gut dysbiosis and heavy metals. And we're like, oh, okay, we're going to deal with all of this. You know, this is the functional medicine model, right? Well, guess what? Does it change the mitochondrial behavior? Nope. Does it usher the mitochondria from CDR1 to CDR2 to CDR3 and back to normal? Nope. Is this the reason why you all have an irreducible nugget of patients that just never seem to get better no matter what you give them? Yep. So the deepest understanding now, based on the most advanced science of genomics and metabolomics, begin to uncover why there is this response to cellular threats, that the response is predictable, it happens in an order, but that these abnormal patterns can become fixed despite a resolution of the threat. So that's key. You can get stuck in a, you know, a CDR1 or CDR2 or even a mix or CDR3. So you can have elements of a pro-inflammatory state. You can have elements of abnormal metabolism and aerobic glycolysis. You can have elements of autoimmunity and neuropsychiatric disorders and cancers.
oh my gosh, Dr. Heyman, that's, that's a breakthrough, but that's, that's concerning. How do we, how do we deal with this? You know, should we just treat what we find? And if, you know, vitamin D is low or magnesium is low, or if I find mercury or if they have dysbiosis, should I treat the leaves on the tree and say, well, I know that's appealing and sometimes that works, but treating those metabolic shifts or metabolomic shifts, these end small molecules will not return the mitochondria back to a healthy state. We need to find other ways. Now, what we've learned, what we've learned in our research, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to make this very clear in, in one of my lectures, is that there are ways to encourage the mitochondria back to normal. And as a result, a lot of these downstream small molecules return to a, uh, a, a, a normal baseline state magically. Incredible. Um, but those treatments are few and far between. Uh, more, I'm sure, will emerge over time as this model uh, becomes better known and, and we, you know, continue to find ways in which to sort of speak directly uh, to, to the mitochondria. Um, but make no mistake, this, this is not, this is, uh, you know, emerging science, it's new science, uh, it's an incredible insight into, uh, you know, what's going on with our patients and why are we measuring what we're measuring as we're looking for these different patterns of molecular expression. And, you know, Dr. Navio has done, uh, you know, the, the yeoman's work in terms of beginning to understand the orchestrations of the mitochondria, the patterning that results at different phases, why that occurs. But then the end question is, how do we usher it uh, back in a normal state of affairs? Do we treat the end results, we find that's not very helpful. So instead, we have to ask the question, how do we help the mitochondria not be stuck in a pattern of expression, especially after the resolution of a threat? Okay. And one way to think about that, one uh, idea that you know, drives this notion is found in genomics in particular, and in our world of transcriptomics. So we're going to look at that. We're going to say, okay, if to some degree what's happening is changes in the patterns of gene expression of the mitochondria is what's altering these downstream activities ultimately, because, you know, when the genes are turning on and off, that's what's altering these pathways. If we can change the genomic activity of the patient, can we change the mitochondria back into a normal state of activity? The answer is yes, we can do that. Well, at least we have a couple tricks in that regard. Now, interestingly, some of the pathways and some of the genes do go back to normal with the more standard types of integrative and functional and anti-aging approaches. And we've shown this in our research that when you do dietary changes and you do use natural compounds and nutrients and, and, and the rest, you know, do some genes to, of the mitochondria return to their baseline state of affairs? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, but there is this irreducible nugget that won't change and that, that's the key is that even though we get patients part of the way and they are feeling somewhat better, there's always this group of genes that just won't respond until we find ways to get those last residual patterns of gene expression back into a normal state of regulation as we call it. That, that's a trick. That's a trick to do that. It's possible. We've shown it, but it's a trick. So keep that in your mind. You know, what we're really talking about with the biotoxin illness is a patient that's basically stuck in CDR1 and CDR2. They have a mix of a pro-inflammatory state and a proliferative physiology state. And so with that, I want to thank you. Uh, hopefully this was very helpful in your understanding of the cell danger response and what it really means with respect to how the mitochondria orchestrate a reaction to a cellular threat and the profound impact that it has on uh, our patient's uh, molecular pathways and uh, 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 systems and their overall health itself.